Hello one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass, the podcast which aims to take you behind the scenes of the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass, as well as the automotive and social media worlds. You join me, your host, Sam, from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass, as well as my trusty producer girlfriend, Vicky. Hi, everyone. Now, this week's Behind the Glass takes on a new meaning because we are quite literally going to be behind the glass. Uh, Those of you watching on YouTube will now see a beer glass floating in front of the camera. Uh, And there's also a white wine glass from Vicky. Um, This is because we've just arrived into our hotel in Munich. uh, And it's been a long couple of days with uh, quite a bit of driving. And we decided to kick back and relax whilst recording this podcast. Now, we might lose Vicky towards the end of this recording because... Love Island is back. Um, UK listeners or viewers uh, will know what I'm talking about, um, but uh, for any international listeners, well, how do we how do we just describe Love Island? It's literally what it, what it says on the tin, <laughs> isn't it? Um, I guess an island for love. For love. Well, it it's not that. It's a reality show, isn't it? It's uh, a reality it's a big show. Brother. Which I suppose most international listeners would know what it is, um, but on an island and with attractive people on the well, supposedly attractive, attractive yeah. people. Attractive is definitely in the uh, eye of the beholder. Uh, it's basically overly gymmed people, uh, gold, yeah, that are sent onto this sort of island, put into this villa for God knows how long, an incredibly long amount of time, six weeks or something ridiculous. No, it goes on for it goes on for the whole summer. I mean, Sam's Months. Sam's words last night were, "Here's another summer lost." To Love Island. It literally is a summer loss because it's sort of nightly episodes. And anyway, you see these people who aren't necessarily always the smartest people in the UK uh, trying to date each other. So anyway, let's not talk about Love Island because I'm sure a lot of my male listeners are probably sick about hearing of Love Island in work or The worst thing is Sam pretends that he doesn't watch, but he actually watches it with me religiously. I'm going to drink my beer So, And and I'm sure many other male listeners also watch it with their girlfriends. Because it's funny, it's funny. The point is it's funny. It's not it's not about being girly or manly or anything like that. It's just nice entertainment, isn't it? Well, anyway, last time you were on the podcast, Vicky, we did say we weren't going to make this into uh, a couple's uh, a couple's show. Uh, let's keep things couples about retreat. cars. Couples retreat. No, let's keep things about cars because that is what Behind the Glass is mainly focused on. Um, now, uh, in this episode, we're actually going to sort of focus on you guys, the listeners. Uh, I put a post out on Instagram asking for you to sub- submit questions or, or or queries, things that we might be able to help you with. It wasn't necessarily a sort of straightforward Q&A like I do on the main channel or on social media, but instead a way that we can try and answer some of the sort of wider queries that sometimes you send me because I get emails from you or, or, or DMs on Instagram saying, you know, I'm thinking about planning a road trip, where should I go? Or I'm considering buying a Jaguar F-Type or a 911, which should I buy? Buy it. Which one? The F-Type. Oh, there we go. Uh, See, look, we're already here to help. Um, But yeah, so we want to try and uh, get through some of those. Um, But before we get onto that, of course, we need to share some stories from the road because season two of Behind the Glass is all about stories from the road, giving you a sort of another alternative look uh, at Drive the World, uh, our big 12-month road trip, which we are now six months into, well, the beginning of the sixth month of this road trip, which is quite terrifying to think of. Um, So if you are watching us on YouTube, uh, hello, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes. And if you are listening to us on whatever podcast player you are using, again, make sure you subscribe or follow so that you get notified when we upload, hopefully, each week. So yeah. Don't forget to comment and, and give me more five stars because I've seen a comment about me. Oh, and, and you've got five stars because of me, so... More, well, well more, okay, more I want to say, I did not see that comment. I did not see that comment. <laughs> anyway, more of that would be great. More engagement. There we go. That's why Vicky is a fantastic producer. So, yeah, here we go. Let's crack on with episode four of season two, Behind the Glass. So... 
So I think it's only appropriate to kick things off with the fact that there is a new Ferrari or a new Ferrari has been launched. And I'm not talking about Formula One, I'm talking about road cars because yes, the SF90 has had its sort of global online debut and actually physical debut. Uh, there was a, a number of sort of events that took place, I believe in Maranello or Fiorano, unveiling the car to media and uh, VIP customers. Uh, JWW was there, I think. Uh, was Schmidt 150 there? Probably. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, unfortunately I wasn't. But I hope to have a chance to check out that car in the flesh at some point. I'm just going to kick things off by saying I don't like it. I don't like the way it looks. Well, I'm you're judging not going to be able to see it now. If you say oh, you no, of course. Freud, oh, actually, I was going to say Freud don't only uh, invite people to their events that are positive about the brand, but I'm not sure that's always the case. But no, they, they are very uh, aware of people's opinions. I'm allowed to have my opinions. I've been negative about Ferraris in the past. Wasn't that big a fan of the Portofino? And I told Ferrari that, and... Well, anyway, they, forget, they forgave me. <laughs> they forgave me. Um, but no, I, based purely on looks, I do not like the SF90. I think it looks weird. I don't think it looks like a Ferrari. But I do think we're in an age at the moment of manufacturers are releasing very futuristic looking cars. If we look back to the McLaren 720S, when that first came out, it was quite horrific, I think. People really didn't understand the looks of that car. But a few years on, and it's starting to age pretty well, or maybe the world is catching up with its design language. So who knows? In a couple of years' time, maybe the SF90 is going to be a looker. But right now, I think it's very odd and very far away from what I consider Ferrari design language. But but, but you still live in, like, the 90s. Me of personally. Design, of design, Ferrari design. Well, you're I'm kind a of fan. You're kind of obsessed with it. To sure. To the point where you wouldn't accept anything new. No, no, I've moved forward. I like the 458 <laughs> Speciale. I like the 599, which was early noughties. Um, I like the you're La Ferrari. You're a classic shape kind of guy. I do prefer classic styling. I will give you that. I prefer classic styling. I'm not a big fan of the sort of quirky aero world that we seem to be embracing at the moment. But there's just parts of that SF90 which I think look a bit toy-like. They just look a bit... Uh, I know it's sort of going to be, we're going to find out that every part of that car is there for a reason. It's probably not an aesthetic car. It's probably a performance car. But I just, yeah, it's, we're, all, we're not, we, I don't have to like all Ferraris. No, it you happens. don't. No, you don't. Um, but what do we think, the question is, about a full production run, hybrid Ferrari that is as powerful as the LaFerrari? For 400k, that's what I was trying to get to, um, for a price which, okay, fine, I think the, the full sort of spec'd up racier version is going to be closer to 500k, but I still think it could be potentially quite a bargain. Uh, the rate of development these days with performance means that we're now getting hypercar levels from five years ago in everyday standard production runs. Um, I do think that's quite mad, and I do think it means we're going to see a lot of these F SF90s. Unfortunately, 500k these days isn't that much for a car. Um, Aventador SVJs, Ford GTs. Um, I don't know if the SVJ is 500k, actually. I've probably made that up. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I think we're going to see a lot of these... S uh, uh, mm, wow, I shouldn't have had this beer, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Sip of the beer. Sip of the beer, beer and I'm gone. Uh, those of you that don't know me well, which is quite a few of you, unfortunately. Uh, I wish I could change that. Uh, will not know that I'm a lightweight. So that this beer, by the end of this podcast, I will be on the floor. So let's keep trying to rattle through things um, and share, share some stories from the road away from the SF90 and update you as to why we are here in Munich in Munich, in our hotel. Oh my hotel. God, slow down. Yeah, okay, maybe I should have some water actually. Uh, Vicky, just, where are we? Munich. We're in Munich. We've just arrived. Uh, we drove the drive from Graz in Austria. Thank you. Was five and a half hours? Five hours? Five hours, five hours with a bit of traffic. So yes, uh, let's bring you up to speed. I think the last time we checked in, we were still in Bulgaria, uh, but we left there, went to uh, Budapest in Hungary. Uh, we were there for an incredibly short amount of time, and you may have seen a main channel video I did there where um, two local car enthusiasts came to my rescue, saved me, uh, because my plans were actually canceled. My original filming plans were canceled due to the rain, due to the weather. I was supposed to be filming with a Koenigsegg. The first time I would have filmed with a Koenigsegg, the CCXS, which appeared on the Cars and Coffee Hungry video. Um, but unfortunately, because of the weather and some other uh, issues, uh, that plan got cancelled. And instead, two amazing local car enthusiasts came to my rescue, 
took me on a tour of Budapest's sort of local car scene, uh, and I ended up making a video I really enjoyed and was really, really pleased with. Uh, so that was great. Um, but then we quickly moved on to Graz in Austria, where we based ourselves for four days or something, I think? Four days. We, we, we used it as a base, yes, and we were in, in and out. In and out for a number of different things. First off, to head over to Werthersee. Well, the Werthersee Treffen or the GTI Treffen. Werthersee. Everyone's giving me a hard time for not pronouncing it correctly, but you're Werthersee. Um, which we have to both agree was absolutely awesome. Yes, in a mad way. In a completely mad eye-opening way. I think neither of us knew what to expect. Obviously, Vicky, a little bit less than I. I I'd done a bit of research and kind of sort of thought I knew what I was walking into, but getting there. Uh, firstly, I'll say that apparently I was there at the completely wrong time and I did sort of learn uh, during our day that really all the main action happens a couple of weeks before the main event, which again doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, but we had an amazing time. We loved it. It was a sort of a taster as to what probably uh, happens a few weeks before and it just means that we have to go back another time. Uh, but again, we were saved by a local enthusiast, but uh, someone with a bit of social media credibility, uh, Nicholas from Audi cult uh, who literally walked past the 9-11 Carrera T uploaded a story saying that he'd seen it and I immediately said look please if you're here help me because I've never been to this event before and I need a guide and he took up that that task that mantle um, with with great aplomb I'm gonna say oh. um, and absolutely smashed it and gave us a, an amazing tour uh, really showed us the sort of the scale of that event um, and tempted us to come back another time. But yeah, we definitely should for a whole for a whole week slash weekend with Paul Wallace, who would be right in his element. I think we both agreed that Paul would absolutely love further see further see further see. But we should explain why it was awesome because for, for those who haven't seen the video, it was just you know a lot of drifting, a lot of noise, a lot of people, a lot of cars, a lot of different cars, some girls. Some naked girls. Okay, <laughs> just stepping and away from the naked girls. Actually, I would say a lot of girls. A lot of girls. The sure. most females I've seen at a car meet ever. Ever. Even going looking at Goodwood Revival, which I would previously had said was the most female attended car event I've ever been to. Um, but yeah, a huge amount of girls that were car owners, drivers, and independent from, let's say, boyfriends or husbands or brothers or, or daughters or what's no... Uh, Fathers, thank you. Um, just purely girls that were there because they wanted to be there, which was great to see, and not something, unfortunately, that you see a lot of in the supercar world. For um, sure, it wasn't a Venaverse fest. It wasn't a Venaverse, yeah, that really <laughs> makes sense. Basically, it wasn't a sausage fest. Um, but yes, there were also some naked girls, which maybe then brought the level of female involvement down a few grades. Um, but I wasn't complaining. Um, Vicky's now death staring me. Uh, <laughs> no, so, um, but yeah, no, it was an awesome event. The main thing for me which really stood out was the passion. It was just a complete display of passion or enthusiasm for all things automotive. You had people building 800 horsepower Mark 1 Golf GTIs. Uh, okay, probably that's a stretch of the imagination, but at least a 1,000 horsepower Nissan GTRs to people who were turning up in their completely regular standard up GTIs or uh, somebody who was in a... a uh, well, something from America. I'm trying to remember what the model was now, but somebody had driven a car from America. I guess they'd shipped it most of the way. Um, so it was just, it was an awesome, awesome place to be. It really felt like a sort of automotive hub uh, of Europe at that one time. Amazing ha views and amazing roads. Well, that's the thing I was going to say. However, at the exact same time, Top Marks was taking place in Monaco. But what I loved was the views. And as you say, the scenery that we were surrounded by, because whilst Monaco is incredible, um, I would argue that the views of Verzathur were even better. The mountains, the trees, the lake, uh, really was quite an outstanding place to be, take away the event. Uh, so yes, absolutely loved it. Please go and check out that main channel video if you haven't seen it, because uh, yeah, different side of the car world that I don't often film or focus or, or feature. Um, focus on I should have said there uh, that was my second sip of beer that's uh, affected yeah. <laughs> yeah, things um, but yeah really really loved that um, we also used our time in Graz to explore or to visit the Red Bull Ring 
in Spielberg. Uh, so this was what I always remembered as the A1 ring, uh, the Osterreich ring. So one of the most iconic and oldest Formula One Grand Prix circuits in Austria uh, was used, I think, from the late 60s or early 70s through to the mid 80s, uh, then took a 10 year gap came back from mid-90s to mid-noughties for the Schumacher era, uh, then again had a gap before it returned in 2015 and is now experiencing Verstappen era. Um, but a track I've always wanted to visit because, again, super picturesque location, but also I just thought it looked like a track that would be fun to drive. And unbelievably, Red Bull put me into one of their Formula 4 cars, 2018 FIA Formula 4 cars, which is a sort of driving experience that you can go, any any people can go and turn up and, and do if you pay the right amount of money. Um, luckily, Red Bull uh, gave me the keys, would you say keys, or the starter button, starter motor uh, for free on that day, which was unbelievable, but lived up to every expectation I had. I'm not going to talk about it too much because uh, there is a video coming. Uh, so stay tuned for that over on youtube.com forward slash seen through glass. Uh, but it was an unbelievable experience. And that was yesterday, and then this morning, as Vicky mentioned, we woke up and drove across here to Munich. But I think we'll save those details for another podcast and come on to the main element, which we teased uh, a good old 15 minutes ago now, so sorry for rambling on. Um, but we want to answer some of your queries, I suppose, about Drive the World, but also about your potential upcoming trips or car purchasing decisions. Um, so yes, I, do we have a name for this section? I don't think we do. It's like an agony aunt section, isn't it? Talk, talk to Sam and Vicky. Mm. Mm, behind the glass. Extra. <laughs> yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure that needs... If you have any suggestions, comment below if you're watching on YouTube, or make sure to tweet or Instagram DM us. And let us know your sections for this kind of, you know... Yeah, we want to keep it and we'll, we'll figure out whether whether it's short or long part of each episode. But we do want to talk to you. And it's it's always so upsetting that we can't reply to each and every message that Sam gets. Because <laughs> I try and help him reply to some of the comments. But it's, it's, it's sad. So we try and make this a bit more focused and... We will probably whittle it down in future weeks to two or three main queries or questions to focusing on. But to kick things off, we wanted to go uh, wanted to go deep and hardcore. answer as many as possible and hardcore. Um, we are creeping up on twenty minutes though, so uh, we're not gonna we're gonna try and rattle things through. We'll yeah. try and give full answers, but, but rattle things through. So anyway, all of these came from Instagram. If you don't follow me on Instagram, it's very simply seen through glass. Head over, check it out. Follow me. Lots of pictures and stories from Drive the World, uh, and we're kicking things off with uh, Larson underscore V who has asked what's the essentials to pack and to have with you when you travel far by car specifically by car oh gosh okay so let's think what's been useful charging cables I mean let's just start with the fact that we've literally packed everything that could possibly be packed in terms of our, like we've packed a lot no but and we've, we've packed a lot for, for the situation. for the adventure for, yeah, of, well, of course. That, that's what that's what they're asking. But no, no. Which, when you travel far by car, that could be a one well, six far hour journey. Like I was driven far enough. Of, no, for sure. But let's not talk about us. It's not necessarily about Sam and Vicky. It's about I'm driving one. around for a year. Yeah, it's about okay. what would one take if you okay. if you've got a long road trip ahead, whether it's two or three days or just one long day. What's an essential okay. thing that you should have? My number one. Yeah. Sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Good tip for the germ phobic of you out there listening or watching. Uh, very important. And actually, yeah, multiple fuel stations, uh, just touching all of the steering wheel and gear levers and stuff. Even though it's in your own car, they are, you know, germ central places. And let's face it, we're going to snack. When we're on the road and it's a long journey, we're going to be snacking. So hand sanitizer, great tip there from Vicky. And especially if you're somewhere like Australia, the toilets, you know, are not. Well, in the middle of Australia. Harsh. Well, what are you I saying use about Australia? Most in Australia. Again, in harsh. In the middle of Australia. I mean, that's fair enough. Australia is huge. So they're just dirty there. Well, the toilets were dirty. Again, harsh. So let's move away from Vicky's <laughs> racism uh, and focus on my vice, which would be yes, charging cables. Obvious to say, and essentials to pack. I was going to say, it's not really a thing to pack, but podcasts. 
I mean, I guess you're listening to a podcast, so you're probably into them. Um, but if this is the only podcast you're listening to, then you're missing out massively because podcasts, I find, are a perfect way to pass time on the road. Um, and there are so many out there from murder mysteries like Serial and uh, Dear John and... Well... What else? Well, what? we can talk. We can talk another time about okay. the, about our favorite podcast because I think that, that's, that could help us. That could help. Yeah. Us. Okay. Okay. But I, I would also say bring comfortable shoes, and if you're traveling with a passenger, the passenger should bring comfortable shoes as well, i.e., driving shoes, because you never know what happens. You never know when you have to jump behind the wheel, and if you're wearing flip flops, ain't gonna work. Good point. Be prepared. That's the best. You know. Uh, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Love that. Okay, moving on. Uh, Matt underscore Lamotte 78. Uh, as ever, when reading Instagram handles, I'm going to pronounce things wrong. I'm going to say things wrong because some Instagram handles are just weird. But Matt, hopefully I said your surname right there. Uh, best place to take my wife for vacation. Ah, sorry. Ah, third sip of beer. Best place to take my wife for vacation, Italy or Switzerland? I'm just, no, I'm not even going to let you say anything. Switzerland. (laughs) Um, So, uh, it's going to be a bit controversial now. I think Italy is a little bit overrated. (gasps) And I know that's a really punchy thing to say, and it depends what you're into and what you enjoy. If you want history, if you want to go into lots of churches and museums and things like this, of course, Italy is fantastic. But if you're just looking for a beautiful experience and to see amazing things and eat great food, Switzerland, I would argue, is slightly better. However, cost. Switzerland will arguably be a lot more than Italy. I think it's a more expensive country. Um, That's hotels, that's food, that's uh, vignettes. Uh, Even though, actually, no, the Italian tolls do add up. But Italy, a lot of the time, I feel like you can go wrong quite easily. For sure, if you're going to Siena or Rome or Florence, any of these iconic cities, they are breathtaking. But the minute you sort of slightly wander off track, you can quite easily end up in a very dodgy service station with very smelly, very argumentative oh Italians. <laughs> so I'm racist for saying that it was one <laughs> dirty toilet in the middle of the <laughs> and now you've just summed up all petrol stations in Italy as dirty smelly. Wow. I wow. get very cross. I think I think you need to take a break. I need to take a break. That's my fourth sip of beer. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing is that I, I think, unfortunately, Vlogari slightly spoilt some of the romanticism of Italy for me personally. Um, too short a time trying to do too much. It meant that I wasn't there enjoying myself as much as I could have or should have uh, and was in an, ended up getting a little bit annoyed and frustrated by a lot of the Italians' way of life. Um, what makes them so special and... Uh, I guess, characterful, unique, unique. thank you, uh, is the fact that, that they are their own people, the Italians, and they're laid back and everything's about living life and emotions and enjoying every single second of the day and not necessarily rushing. I come from London, a city where people literally will work out and eat lunch at the same time just because they don't have enough time to do it at any other time in the day. Uh, so, you know, when I'm trying to order an espresso and they're talking about the football and a lot of people love that. It annoyed me. But and Swiss and Swiss people, as opposed to that, are very, you know, like punctual. Swiss watches. Sm- literally, punctual. I mean, it's the stereotype, but they they match that stereotype, and I enjoy the punctuality. So, so it depends what you're after, mm-hmm. really, and it depends on the place because to 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 you know battle away Sam's generalization of Italy. Uh, you know, you do have places like Venice, which are magical, and you do have places like the Amalfi Coast, which is also magical. And you can have a very, very nice time if you're not in the rush like Sam is all Good the point. time. As I say, I think it was a personal issue. And Switzerland, issue. where would you recommend in Switzerland? Where should one go on a vacation in Switzerland? Uh, any of the lakes, Lucerne specifically, uh, Zurich, not Geneva. Um, but just the mountains, just get out into the mountains. If you want to, if you want to just stay and zonk out, I guess fine. You can go and be in one of those spa retreats. Uh, if you want to be active and hike and bicycle, it's nature it's versus, an, yes, good versus point. you know heritage and historic places in Italy. I think that's which would the... you pick? I didn't actually ask you. Well, I would definitely pick Italy because I think, well, like I said, some places of Italy, like Venice. The Amalfi Coast, 
You okay, know, fair. I think Switzerland's a little bit boring. It's amazing, but a little bit boring. And let's leave it at that. Let's move on. Uh, okay, uh, Tim Mitkin. Yeah, Tim Mitkin. That's what I'm going with. Our language is a big challenge when visiting other countries. Yes. Um, I'll just go out and say this as the... Uh, For Sam. <clears throat> who's been speaking more German whilst in Austria and oh Germany? Oh, my God. I Hello. minute is not German. No, I said zwei minute earlier. The, the delivery man called me. And I meant to say zwei minuten, which I think means two minutes. Please correct me if I'm wrong, German, German listeners. Uh, but I went zwei minute because I panic. We've been moving around and traveling so much that I forget which language we sp- should be speaking when. And it's just very difficult. Um, and so, yeah, I said zwei minute. But... Yes, as a British man, who unfortunately we are so lazy as Brits because you can go anywhere in the world. So just speak English, and most people say yes. Um, I, I would find that languages are a yeah a big big part and a big challenge. Uh, Asia, I guess it was slightly more difficult than Europe. Europe, we've been doing a bit better. Um, more people speak English, I would suppose, um, but we try and pick up things. You try and pick up little things. Go on, but, what are you going to say? Your, well, your challenge is always you know you can say a few words Mm -hmm. but the issue is that you always try and pronounce them with an english accent which is very wrong like you don't really immerse yourself into the country pizza margarita is that what you're saying you were sort of yeah mercy bacoop yeah (laughs) (laughs) i'm not tony from gravelwood it's just it's just you know you try and say it with a posh english accent whereas actually you know it's italian or it's you know, Portuguese. We can't all be bilingual like little Miss Vicky over there. Well, uh, no, it's, it's, about, it's, it's about immersing yourself. I'm just trying to. Just stickulating. There we go. Um, but I would say Google Translate is a fantastic app. Uh, moving on. Tommy underscore G. Tommy, what's up, Tommy? Uh, are you trying to stick to a budget, keep costs down? If so, how do you manage it? Uh, that's a very drive the world specific question question i suppose um of course we're trying to stick to a budget uh, all of the kickstarter activity and sponsors and partners that you see all over the car and me talking about during this year all helping contribute towards that budget uh had a pretty pretty nailed down budget before we left that we were trying to uh cover or raise funds for but a huge majority of this trip is coming out of uh my own pocket um but uh, hopefully it is worthwhile. And of course, let's not forget, I'm not going to glorify this. Seen Through Glass is a business. I'm doing this as a business venture. Um, and so I'm hoping for reward in terms of profit. Uh, but also there is experience behind it. And hopefully it's something that you guys are uh, enjoying and engaging with. But it's definitely not cheap. Um, but well, I'm gonna... there, is, there is a budget There is a budget for every, every single day. And we yes. are running on a very, very tight budget. Hence why we're having Deliveroo. I don't want to dwell on this too much because I feel like it's a very drive the world specific (laughs) question and it's something we should talk about in another podcast and uh, also it just scares me talking about money uh, for this year. So you've had a panic attack. I've had a panic attack. Let's move on. However, uh, Kerry Beal, uh, Kerry Beal uh, is not going to help us move on because his next question is, are you using cash much or mostly paying with card? And the only reason I'm going to answer this is because I want to talk about, uh, and I don't actually have it with me, my Curve card um, because they are a partner. Don't worry, you don't need to jump up and get it. Um, they are a partner. And so I just mentioned the fact that partners are helping me with Drive the World and with budgets and Curve are pretty much doing all of that because uh, I, I did talk about it in a video with the 911 Turbo whilst I was in Barcelona and I've done some posts on on social media about them but effectively they are one card for all your cards so this year I'm traveling just with my curve card I can put all my visas and MasterCards uh, sort of on an app and then manage which card I'm using when I use the physical curve card um, I have multiple accounts I have business accounts and savings accounts and personal accounts and a drive the world account so it's really helpful for me to be able to switch cards depending on what I'm spending money on but also to keep track of how we're spending that money because we within the app it divides it up and tells me over the last month or even in real time how much I'm spending on fuel and restaurants and hotels and everything you could possibly imagine so we can easily look at it and say okay we've spent too much on coffee let's bring that down next month and it it has been really really interesting and in fact uh the first month in Europe was our most expensive of the entire trip. We did unbelievably well in Australia. Uh, Asia started to increase slightly our costs. Uh, Europe got crazy, and then we've saved a lot of money 
Romania over the last month because we spent a couple of weeks in Bulgaria with Vicky's parents, which was a winner. So Curve is fantastic. I can't promote them and talk about them enough because they've really been helping me out. If you want to get hold of a Curve card, if you're in Europe and you want to get hold of one, uh, you can use my discount code, which is STG19. Uh, that will get you five pounds worth of credit basically on your card uh, when you activate it and uh, it gets rid of all the international transaction fees uh, as soon as you spend money it pops up on your phone so you can see exactly how much something's cost you in whatever currency you're in uh, and they're great i'll talk about them more i'm sure in more detail um, but that is curve card that's the most the, that's the most important thing about traveling abroad is not having to take cash out and actually saving on the foreign transactions because usually people take cash out to in, you know, in bulk to save their foreign transactions. But when your card actually doesn't charge you anything, it's it's a no brainer. And then and then I've been really I've been the petty cash tin yeah. this trip <laughs> where Megan, do you have five euros? That is literally um, it. So no, we haven't been using that much cash, but it's always good and handy to have. Tolls. Tolls. Yeah. You need cash for tolls for sure. However, most places now have started using accepting cards at tolls. Um but anyway, that's, uh, that's again, as I say, uh, a little bit financial. And uh, right now I'm having a panic over finances. So <laughs> let's move on. Uh, Nick Pennings. Nick. Nick Pennin X, how do you plan your next leg of a road trip? Just open maps, navigation, and go. Um, so I, I want to open this up and make it about, you know, not necessarily about drive the world, but about planning road trips. Um, plan quite a few uh, over the years. I would say work out firstly your overnight stops. So that's usually the easiest thing to do. Work out where you want to stop, where you want to stay, and then try and work out the most interesting routes in between those places. If you just go, okay, cool, we'll drive and we'll figure out somewhere to stay, it's always going to be a headache and a nightmare because you're not always going to find somewhere to stay and then you end up having to bolt on an hour or two hours to the end of your day and it just kind of ruins it slightly. So if you're driving from London to Rome and you don't think you're going to be doing it all in one day, literally work out where is the middle point, the halfway point, and then look and research the little towns nearby, find yourself a cute hotel or B&B &B or uh, wherever you might want to stay, hostel or campsite, and then, as I say, work out your route to that place. I always try and average six to eight hours maximum within a day's worth of driving. Of course, I've done longer. London to Monaco is always longer than that. But six to eight hours, by the time you've stopped for fuel and lunch and allowed for traffic and got distracted, usually means that's a pretty full day worth of driving without absolutely wanting to kill yourself by the end of the day. So yes, that would be my, my top tip is um, don't just open navigation and go definitely plan your overnight stop. Are you going to ask me about my top tip? No. Uh, <laughs> moving on. You're because, horrible. No, I'm not, but we're really like, we, we're I going over. I might as over. well leave the podcast. I will tell you how, we are nine minutes late for Love Island, okay? And we are... Uh, this is why you're stressing out. It's yes. not about, it's not about the finances. But also, I just don't want to dwell too much on drive the world i think that's a separate podcast a separate chat a separate video which we are planning it is in the planning and this was supposed to be more about your general questions about things so here we go perfect example for vicky to get involved uh prad <laughs> sb uh, i'm potentially planning a gap yar road trip i love the gap yar do you remember gap yar did you ever see that? Were you in the UK for Gap Yard? No, I wasn't in the okay. UK for Gap Yard. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm potentially planning a Gap Yard road trip. Uh, what roads countries are the best to go to? Now, Prad, or Pra, I don't really know your first name. Uh, I don't know where you're based. I'm going to assume Europe. Well, UK. Or Who UK? else would say Yard? And there's not Good really point. a gap yard thing anywhere else in Europe. Solid. Okay. So let's assume you're UK based. Vicky, I'll let you go first. I already have a solid idea for the answer for this. What? I, for I forgot the question. Oh my God. How much wine have you drunk? Uh, what roads or countries are the best to go to? Don't worry about roads. Let's go countries. Right. Straight away. New Zealand, of course. Boston. I mean, it's a it's one of a lifetime kind of experience, and you know, if you don't do it now, if you don't get yourself over there now, you probably never will because it's a long ass flight, <laughs> um, and uh, it's just incredible. It it will be like nowhere else you you would go and you would see in your life. So, very mind blowing. Definitely do that. Uh, anywhere else before I jump in? Um really torn between well it depends what kind of person you are doesn't it good point um 
I would say between, if you want to go nearby, between Portugal, Lisbon, and Venice. Okay, and, okay. <clears throat> road trip. <laughs> to Portugal Ven- and Venice. Venice? I mean, yeah. we drove to Venice, I guess. But yeah. Okay, uh, sure. Amazing places. I think on a gap year, maybe not that appropriate. Lisbon, for sure, on a gap year would be ace. Venice, I think, is a place to go, you know, a little bit later on in life, personally. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to agree yes. with you with New Zealand. I'm going to throw in Australia because I think if you're going on a gap year, I never went on a gap year, by the way, so I always slightly uh, imagine and dream of, of doing so one day. But I guess that's what we're doing right now, isn't it? But anyway, moving on. Uh, Australia. Because it's an amazing country. There's so much to see. It's huge. You will be distracted endlessly by beaches and parties and lots of different things. And there's a million road trips that you can do there. There's just, you know, road trip after road trip after road trip. That's exactly the reason that I was thinking. Um, But two slightly more out there places. If you want to have a true eye-opening experience, India... Don't drive yourself, uh, get a driver, um, uh, but still a road trip because we did do, Vicky and I did do a road trip in India uh, from Delhi to the Taj Mahal across to Jaipur and back to Delhi. It's a very famous sort of triangular road trip. Okay, fine, we weren't driving and it was absolutely terrifying, but it was amazing and it was eye opening. And if you want to see a completely different way of life and a different culture, that is one place to go and check out. I've heard brilliant things about the south of India as well. Uh, and then one thing which I wish we had time to have done this year or what maybe I'll do in the future at some point is the iconic Vietnam motorbike road trip from the north to the south what they did in, on Top Gear uh, I think actually they did south to the north on Top Gear didn't they but uh, when we were in Bulgaria we went for drinks with one of uh, Vicky's friends and uh, her boyfriend was telling me that he'd just done that trip or he did do that trip recently um, Vietnam on a motorbike and it was absolutely unbelievable and it's something I've always wanted to do and I think as I say gap years are about experiences and uh, and finding out sort of new cultures new ways of life and India and Vietnam I think would be two two ways to do that okay uh moving on how many more questions have we've got uh Marcus Curran 44 I'm guessing 44 for Lewis Hamilton so what up Marcus uh how do you keep yourself motivated after months on the road we <laughs> do <laughs> oh that's a, that's a that's a whole I'm not sure that's even a podcast but uh I'll have another sip of beer on yeah, that one. If, um, if you ask us, we would say that we we lose a tiny bit of motivation with every day that passes <laughs> by. Uh, but we still somehow have a little bit of that initial motivation that was Sam's motivation to do the trip and, you know, eventually reflected onto me as well. There we go. And without getting sappy, uh, those of you listening or watching, you are the main motivation, uh, providing content and uh, entertainment for you guys. Is the only reason we're doing this, uh, fundamentally. Of course, we're getting great personal experiences, but this is this is not a year's holiday. We are not going to the Maldives and Mauritius uh, and sunning it up and having a brilliant time. We're here making content. Uh, in Munich. Working in Munich, in a hotel. By the Olympic Park. By the Olympic Park. It's not the most picturesque location ever, but it's, you know, it will do. Uh, Wolford 381 uh, your trip has inspired me to do something similar here we go listen to this uh, is it possible to do it on a budget well I think we've talked about the fact that we're doing it on a budget but I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about on a reduced budget uh, and I'll just jump straight in and say yes of course absolutely um, the huge expense that uh, we're incurring this year is mainly because of the shipping of the car uh, the various insurances the costs of production and the scale of the trip we're doing um you could do it for a much more slimline budget, I suppose, if you weren't in a car. I'm mean, well, I guess. If you weren't in a in a in a Porsche. Yeah, the Porsche. You know, yeah, there we go. Your petrol costs a, a lot less. Reduce petrol costs. You could you could backpack it. You could stay in hostels or camp in your vehicle. A huge number of our costs are coming from hotels. Yes, so hotels and food are the main. Sort and food. Of, good point. You know. Uh, place where the money goes <laughs> yeah those, those are the day-to-day so costs you, if you, that if you, add if you're up staying in if you're staying in a, an airbnb or with friends you can always cook dinners there and you know make breakfast which is what we try to do it's not always possible but that definitely saves money and you know you're not really you know when you're traveling you're seeing amazing stuff you don't have to pay any money you're just paying for the petrol if you find a place to stay and you buy a little bit of food you can definitely do it yeah, we're, we're, we're finding ways to save money every single day because we need to. Uh, and this is definitely not a super extravagant trip. But there are certain th- costs that we 
incur because of the way we are trying to do this trip, because of the content I'm trying to make, the distances we're trying to cover, the places we need to be, the events we want to uh, attend, uh, and the car that we're doing it in to try and make the content as engaging as possible, incurs naturally higher costs. Um, but we are massively budget conscious. So wherever possible, uh, we're trying to skim some money. Um, but for sure, uh, you could do it for less. So yes, please, uh, it's amazing that you're inspired. Everything we were just saying about the fact that you guys are our motivation, uh, people that are inspired by this trip, brilliant to hear. Get out and do something similar because uh, it's definitely something, you'll be creating memories, memories for the rest of your life, um, even if the motivation slowly saps out of you. Uh, <laughs> Keir Charles Nicholson. Keir, Keir Charles Nicholson. Uh, wanted to plan a driving trip through France and Spain. Any tips on accommodation? And Oh, uh, where was that? France and Spain. If you ask us where we stayed yesterday, we don't remember. Yeah. So yeah, good point. We should have probably rehearsed this one. France and Spain. Well, we where did we stay? In, we stayed in Biarritz. Was it nice, that hotel, though? No, we were in that no, cupboard. No, but we were, we, because, again, back to saving money, booking.com, cheapest room available, shoved us in a basement of a pretty nice hotel otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but what was it called? It was called Silhouette or something like that. God, you've got a good memory. And as long as you choose the right room, <laughs> yeah. you're, the you're, onto, room. you're onto a winner. But the, the Beerus is definitely a place to stay a midway point sort of mm. uh, where did we stay before Biarritz? uh tours tours yeah tours was amazing tours was well. nice tours was Pretty, really nice a nice little town quaint town not much to see but it's on the loire river which was uh incredible to drive alongside and then you've got the chateau route which has a lot of castles along the way that and was so very you nice. yeah so so that's definitely one little road trip through france that can be done uh and yeah if you i would have liked in tours, sorry yeah, keep going. Okay. I got excited. No, 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 I had no, no, a thought. No. Uh, I would have liked to have stopped in Oviedo. I really liked Oviedo. That was well, that after oh, the Fernando yes. Alonso Museum. I would have liked to have spent a night there. That seemed super cool with the Woody Allen statue. Yeah, that, that was that was a really nice, sweet town. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Oviedo is a good shout for Spain. Any other tips? Where were we in Marbella? I can't remember. I mean, uh, tips on accommodation. I think Vicky's hit the nail on the head. We're not really going in on the sort of hotels and fantastic Airbnbs this year because we're so budget restrictive. It is a case of booking.com and the cheapest available and then just making sure that it hasn't got rats in it. Uh, every now and again, incredible hotels like the Peninsula in Hong Kong, Four Seasons Geneva, um, Mallorca, the, the Marriott in Mallorca come through and support us and offer to help us stay at their amazing places uh, and those places are incredibly special and those nights are incredibly special the rest of the time we're in pretty generic businessy hotels that have parking and wi-fi available so uh, all i would say is uh yeah we like beer it we would like to stay in oviedo um you can't really go wrong in france and spain I think they're both Where pretty else did awesome. We stay in Spain. Well, we we, we went south. That's thing we sort of skipped we, we a lot of the middle. We went to Bilbao again. We stayed at a pretty Bilbao. pretty generic hotel. So you're better off not listening to our advice for Spain because we we did not uh, stay anywhere particularly nice. No, but yeah, I don't think we did. Mallorca. We stayed at a pretty nice hotel. Um, we need to remember the name. Not very helpful, are we, on this? No. Probably should have thought. I, this, I did say we should rehearse this, and Vicky said, no, it'll be fine. Pick the questions two minutes before. Anyway, uh, we are now very quickly approaching 45 minutes, which for me is far too long for a podcast, because let's face it, um, oh, actually, when did you guys listen to this? Because I was going to say, maybe you listened on the way to work, and therefore, 45-minute commute's already getting too long, isn't it? Anyway, maybe not. Okay. Let me know. Comment below. Do a last one. Yeah, do a last one. Sorry. Ben.judge43. This is going to be a very uh, me-focused question, I suppose. Any modern classics under 40K that spring to mind that could be good investments? Uh, yes. Uh, Porsche Cayman R. Gen 1 Cayman R. I think they're under 40K. Maybe they're like just over 40K. But that is a car that I think will start to creep up. It was... The the pre GT4 they didn't make a GT4 for the original Cayman uh, Cayman R was good as it can get but it's effectively the same premise of a hardcore racier Cayman um, I really like it they offered it in some wacky colours um, supposed to be amazing fun to drive I think it's a winner um, any other modern classics under that money not sure off the top of my head but Cayman R is one that I've been looking out for again anything you want to well, I don't on know there? how much things cost go on take a wild stab I'll let you know if you're right or wrong. Oh, 
a good I don't investment. No, I don't know. Make it up. I can't. What card do you want to buy? It's some sort of Jaguar. Can I buy some sort of Jaguar for under 40 game? No. Yeah, it's not going to be an investment, but you could. You could. You could buy a V6 F type, but you're just going to lose money. So, yeah. Don't what about a Maserati? Okay, now we're really going off track. <laughs> um, anyway, I think we're going to wrap it up because I say uh, I've definitely drunk far too much beer uh, and I, I underestimated just how long it would take us to get through some of these questions. I would love to crack on and keep going forever, um, but I'm always keen to keep these podcasts relatively short because um, I think it's important to... Uh, to keep it concise, even though I'm not sure this has been our most concise episode, uh, I will blame the free welcome drinks that we got upon check-in. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Either way, I hope you found it informative, insightful. Um, another episode of Behind the Glass. As I say, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure to hit subscribe, turn on notifications, that little bell, uh, so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're listening to us, uh, make sure to follow. Keep listening uh, on whatever platforms you're listening to us on. That's about it. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>